Well, in 1976, the Supreme Court of the United States said that it was okay for states to kill their prisoners. The government could take somebody who was already in jail, remove them from their cell, walk them down the hall to a room set up specifically for the purpose of killing people, and then they could kill that prisoner there. That was 1976, that Supreme Court ruling. It was not until 12 years after that that the Supreme Court said, okay, even though it is legal in America to kill our prisoners, you can't kill our prisoners who are children. You can't kill people who were under the age of 16 when they committed the crime for which you want to kill them. That decision was made in 1988. If you were, six, if you were 16, if you had turned 16 when you committed the crime, if you were 16 and one day uh, after that ruling in 1988, it was still okay to kill you for that crime. But if you were less than 16, that was the line that was drawn then, 1988. 17 years after that, in 2005, was when the Supreme Court said, actually, no, the cutoff now is 18 years old. You cannot kill teenagers in America as punishment for crimes they committed before they were old enough to vote. So that's where we were up until a couple of years ago in this country. Constitutionally speaking, kids cannot legally be killed by our government. The state can't actively take a kid's life. But kids could still be sentenced to die. They could be sentenced to die in prison. That's called life without the possibility of parole. It is a sentence to never get out of prison. It is a sentence to die behind bars. In 2010, a legal office called the Equal Justice Initiative, which is in Alabama, it's run by a really remarkable guy named Brian Stevenson. Brian Stevenson argued a Supreme Court case about the constitutionality of sentencing American kids to die in prison. The outcome of that case in 2010 was a ruling that said a kid could not be sentenced to die in prison unless he had committed murder. Well, this year, 2012, Equal Justice Initiative and the same Brian Stevenson went back to the Supreme Court again. We talked to Brian Stevenson on this program back in March, right after he did the oral arguments in this case. What he was arguing this time around was that even if your crime is murder, if you commit that crime when you are a kid, the government should not be able to sentence you to die in prison. And today, the Supreme Court ruled in that case. They said there cannot be mandatory death in prison for a crime committed by a child. In America now, if you are a kid when the crime is committed, you must at least get a hearing on what your sentence ought to be. You must at least be allowed to argue that you should not be sentenced to die in prison. No more mandatory death in prison sentences for people who commit crimes when they are kids. There are about 2,500 people in the United States who were sentenced to die in prison for something they did as a child. By virtue of today's ruling, those people will now get hearings about whether or not they ought to die in prison or whether they should get some lesser sentence that offers them some chance of getting out ever. The United States is one of only a few countries that even has or uses the death penalty for any of our citizens. More than two-thirds of countries in the world have gotten rid of the death penalty either by law or by practice. We here in the United States are still one of the world's top five enthusiasts of using the death penalty. That puts us on a top five list with China, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and Iraq. For the record, on the juvenile side of this, we are also the only country in the world besides Somalia, which isn't even really a country anymore, um, that has not ratified the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. But even though my lifetime so far has basically been a generation of the United States being willing to be an international anomaly, almost a rogue state on issues like this, sometimes, even in this lifetime, the Brian Stevensons of the world win. Sometimes people swimming against that incredible tide win. Sometimes they make progress. And now, even though it has taken until the year 2012, we have concluded that the explicit constitutional requirement that we not be inhumane, that's in the Bill of Rights. No cruel or inhuman punishment, right? That's in the Bill of Rights. And we have decided now in 2012 that that constitutional explicit requirement that our government not act in an inhumane manner when punishing people, that requirement means that someone at least ought to maybe consider thinking about it before sentencing an American child to die in an American prison. That said, all of the conservatives on the court were against this ruling.
Chief Justice John Roberts all but shouting from the pages of his angry dissent that it could not possibly be cruel and unusual punishment to sentence kids to die in prison in America because we do it to so many of them. See, if you, if you sentence 2,000 kids to die in prison, that's no longer unusual, right? Am I right? It's frequent. Justice Samuel Alito was so angry in his dissent that he read it from the bench, out loud, at volume. Anthony Kennedy was the swing justice in this case. These days, Anthony Kennedy sides mostly with the conservatives on just about everything. But on the issue of sentencing American children to die, either in prison or on a lethal injection gurney down the hall from their cells, Anthony Kennedy has sided in the past and today again sided with the liberals. The liberals are not lucky, however, to have that same swing justice with them on issues of democracy and corruption. Justice Kennedy was the author of the decision in the most justly famous radical Supreme Court decision since Bush v. Gore, Citizens United. That case, of course, struck down decades of anti-corruption election law and said that corporations need to be able to spend in an unlimited fashion to be able to dominate the political discourse in our country as much as they want to. At a time when corporate profits are at an all-time historic high and American wages are at an all-time historic low, no literally, both those things happening at once, <laughs> one might think that corporations are doing okay getting what they want. <laughs> They're doing just fine dominating American politics and policy on their own without this big assist from the Supremes. But given the opportunity to partially reverse or at least limit the impact of the Citizens United ruling by letting states guard at least their own state elections from being outright bought, today Justice Kennedy sided with the conservatives again and proclaimed that Montana's century-old Anti-Corrupt Practices Act be overthrown. Citizens United stands, not only at the federal level, but at the state level. There is no bulwark against that decision. Both of these decisions today, the Montana decision and the sentencing kids to die in prison ruling, um, were frankly overshadowed by the ruling uh, that mostly struck down Arizona's anti-immigrant papers please law. We're gonna be talking about that a little bit later on in the show. But even these, these overlooked decisions today, the Montana decision and the killing kids in prison decision today, even those ones, even though they, those were over, overlooked today, they even got a heck of a lot more attention than another decision that came down last week, last Thursday, which you should definitely know about, particularly given what just happened with this Montana ruling today. Now, the supposed free speech argument in favor of Citizens United and this Montana ruling today and all these other rulings that are overthrowing the anti-corruption laws, the supposed free speech argument, right, is that corporations are just like people and money is just like speech. And so just as you can't limit people's speech rights, you can't limit corporations' money rights. You can't limit spending. The idea is that if you, if you don't like the idea of the Koch brothers spending $400 million to help Mitt Romney beat Barack Obama this year, if you don't like that idea, the remedy to that is easy. All you have to do is spend $400 million of your own money on the other side from them. See, if money and speech are locked in a sort of murderous analogy here, then the way you balance somebody else's speech, right, is with more speech of your own. That's always been the free speech argument. But if the money is analogous to the speech here, the Supreme Court's argument is that the way you balance somebody else's money in politics is with more money of your own. What if you don't have the money? Who has more money than corporations and the super rich? to spend on politics to get more policies that benefit them even more than policies already do. I mean, by definition, nobody has more money than the super rich, right? <laughs> and the only aggregate source of money that might conceivably compete with the aggregation of money that can come from corporations, conceivably, I guess that's unions, right? So even though all corporations' money in American politics basically goes to one side, it goes hugely disproportionately to the Republican side, we're not supposed to see Citizens United as a partisan thing. Because, at least theoretically, the same decision frees up unions to spend a lot of money, too. So maybe that equalizes everything, right? As this conservative court has been twisting itself into really admirable gymnastic legal radicalism in order to flood corporate money into politics, which incidentally always goes to Republicans, they have also been limiting how unions can spend in politics. Last week, and nobody really noticed it at all, but last week the Supreme Court erected some elaborate new barriers to participation in elections by public sector unions. 
requiring that unions get affirmative approval from their members before making dues assessments to fund campaigns countering corporations. This is John Nichols uh, writing about this today at The Nation. John Nichols, this is coming right after John's year and a half of dedicated day-to-day -day passionate reporting about the partisan efforts to dismantle unions in Wisconsin because unions in Wisconsin help Democrats. That was the whole Scott Walker controversy, right? So how level is this playing field that's been set up by the Supreme Court? Corporate money has been absolutely unleashed. Union money getting clamped down on. So here's a hypothetical for understanding how that works. If, if Walmart, say, wanted to support candidates who promised to eliminate all taxes for Walmart, that corporation, Walmart, could spend unlimited amounts of money to do that. Unlimited. In any level of election that it wanted to. It would not need to gain stockholder approval. It can just go for it. But let's say AFSCME, let's say a public sector union, wants to counter that argument from Walmart, saying that eliminating taxes on a big out-of-state retailer might save consumers a little bit in the short run, but ultimately it'll undermine funding for schools and public services. If the union wants to do that kind of spending, the union, unlike Walmart, has to go through this laborious new process of gaining permission from tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of members. And even after it goes through the process of gaining permission, even then it faces additional reporting and structural barriers imposed by the court. So it's very, very, very free speech for corporations, but it is not free speech for unions. And the whole First Amendment argument here is supposedly that this frees up unions as much as it frees up corporations. No. And now the states can offer you no shelter from this totally legalized, unlimited corruption in elections that has been greenlit by Citizens United, which means we will have elections whose choices and outcomes are materially predetermined by politicized billionaires and corporations for the duration from here on out at every level of American democracy until we amend the U.S. Constitution as a way of overturning this ruling, or conceivably, I guess, until we get a new Supreme Court substantially reconstituted that wants to reverse these precedents just set by these rulings. But it will be harder for state governments to kill American children now. So there's that.